Hello everyone! Welcome to Jane Austen On Point, historical analysis of dancing in Jane Austen adaptations. I'm Cassiany Mobley, and today is part three of my series on Pride and Prejudice, which covers the BBC miniseries from 1980. If you're new here, I've linked part one and two of this series in the description. They each cover a different adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, namely the ones from 1995 and 2005. But you don't have to watch them to be able to enjoy this one. However, I do recommend watching my video Five Things That Jane Austen Adaptations Always Get Wrong About the Dancing because it's a general introduction to the concepts I cover in this series. As always, I will start by giving my general impression of the adaptation as a whole, share one piece of general snark, and then review the dances. All right, standard disclaimer that I'm not here to ruin anyone's favorite adaptation by pointing out historical inaccuracies in the dancing, nor am I equating historical accuracy with overall artistic merit in terms of dance or anything else in these adaptations. I'm just here to answer the question, are these dances historically accurate? That's all. Anyway, if you can pardon the 1980 version for being made on a shoestring budget, this adaptation is actually quite faithful to the book, and I really enjoy it. It's one episode shorter than its 1995 counterpart, but it never feels rushed. If anything, the pacing is still a little slow at times. The acting is more understated than in the 1995 version, and there are pros and cons to that. It makes comic characters like Mrs. Bennet and Mr. Collins seem even more absurd, but some of the quiet characters like Jane suffer because of it. Darcy is definitely more of an enigma in this version. He's so emotionally deadpan that Lizzie's astonishment seems fully justified when he proposes to her. I think that's a valid reading of the character. I mean, I think the only reason Charlotte picks up on Darcy's feelings for Elizabeth is because she keeps noticing him doing things like asking Elizabeth to dance and visiting her at the parsonage. And that really is in keeping with the book where she notices Darcy doing these things, but he looks so sullen that she can't tell if he's in love or just bored. I really love Elizabeth Garvey's portrayal of Elizabeth Bennet. This Elizabeth is very subtle. She's very sweet and feminine while still being strong, independent, and smart. I particularly love the scene where she's talking about literature and music with Colonel Fitzwilliam with such wit and spirit. It's not in the book, but it's a great detail totally in keeping with her character. She also does a really great job of concealing her contempt for Mr. Darcy with such a sweet expression that I totally understand why he thinks she's in love with him. The Lady Catherine in this version is also very different in a way I like. In all the other versions, she has a very sour temper, but in this, she's more affable while being just as snobbish and overbearing. I will also say props for casting a tall actor to play Mr. Collins. That's a detail I've always remembered from the book, but didn't see in the more recent versions where they prefer to cast him as a comically short character. This version is also much more critical of Mr. Bennet, who is ill-humored and at times cruel to his wife and younger daughters. I prefer the witty and teasing version of Mr. Bennet from the 1995 version, but again, I think the reading of the character this way is valid because he is cruel in the book, as well as being witty and charming at times. My snark for this version is this hat scene with Mr. Collins. It's not in the book, but it's the sort of thing that crackpot inventors in the 19th century came up with all the time. A top hat with a flotation device. Because that works. Right, no, don't think about the physics involved in that. It'll just make my brain hurt. Anyway, let's talk about the dancing in this version. Well, what passes for dancing anyway? Before I go into individual dances, I have to say overall this is the worst approximation of English country dancing I've seen in a Jane Austen adaptation, and I'm kind of horrified that it happened in a production of Pride and Prejudice, the most dance-centric novel Austen wrote. Not only are the tunes and choreographies absurdly wrong, and there's an entire lack of footwork, but also the styling is so bad that it doesn't even look aesthetically pleasing on camera. It's chaotic, but not because they want it to look chaotic, it's because the dancers haven't been trained to dance well. Contrast this with the 2005 version that uses chaos as an aesthetic in the Meriton Ball scene, and they make it work. 
I know I said I didn't like the chaotic aesthetic in that scene, but it was still a clear and well-executed artistic choice. The room is overcrowded, the people are squashed together like sardines in a can, and the dances are moving with a lot of energy. But the dancing is still of a much higher quality than what we see in this older version. In this version, they can't even keep the lines dressed, even though they have a lot of room to dance with. And the dancing looks sloppy. There's no other word for it. And this is a problem, because dancing well was a huge deal in the Regency. Ladies and gentlemen had dance lessons from the time they were kids, and people would have preferred to skip dancing entirely than to dance badly like this in public. Kind of like how most people today won't dance in public for fear of looking bad in front of others. It was even worse in the Regency. So yeah, people from this social class in the Regency should be proficient dancers. And this is bad dancing. The choreographies are also really simplified, and most of the dances don't even progress, and we don't even get to see any of them for very long. It's painful. This is a minimal effort given to an important aspect of the narrative. I have to conclude that they really didn't care about dancing in this. Either the staging, the training of the dancers, or the filming of it. A mini-series of Mansfield Park, also produced by the BBC, came out only three years later. And while the dancing is far from perfect, it's a huge upgrade in terms of all three of those features. I'll be covering that miniseries in a future episode. It makes me wonder if there was criticism from the historical dance community for the clear lack of effort that went into this version of Pride and Prejudice, and that's why we see such a marked improvement in Mansfield Park. Anyway, it's a real shame because I like this miniseries of Pride and Prejudice, but I find the dancing next to unwatchable. In addition to the styling being bad, all the tunes they use for dancing are either from the 1600s or are original compositions written in that style, which is not accurate for the Regency. Regency dancers used contemporary music, and the only tune I know of from the 1600s that was still in common use was Sir Roger de Coverley. So this adaptation gets zero points for music. Anyway, let's look at what passes for dances here on an individual level. The first dance we see is a recognizable English country dance tune called Bury Fair from 1696. The original choreography for this dance was a triple minor, and the figures would have been appropriate for the Regency, but the figures they're using here instead are not great, especially the arming. It's a shame. At least the honors at the end of the dance look decent though, unlike the 1972 Emma. For the second dance, if you can even call it a dance, it's a circle formation. If you remember from earlier videos, the only circle dance being done in Jane Austen's lifetime was Le Boulanger, and that was used only for the last dance of the evening. And this is not Le Boulanger, so it's a formation failure. I especially have problems with this style of slow Baroque tunes for Regency dancing because it was really out of style by Jane Austen's lifetime. I said in my last video that it's the equivalent of playing ragtime at a high school prom. The older tunes that did survive from this era tended to be lively reels and jigs, more in the folk music line than the Baroque court slash classical style. But this tune and the next seem to be original compositions for this production. And they're really well done for this much older style, but again, the style is not appropriate for the Regency. I also want to snark about the B part of this song because it makes me think of the song C'est Moi from Camelot. Seriously. Huh? I'm surprised that you listen to as a most disagreeable countenance and is about being pleased. I do agree. I've never lost in battle or game. I'm simply the best by far. The figures themselves aren't bad, but these hand turns should be lower, more at the mid chest to waist level, and not nearly that close to your partner. The idea in Regency dancing was to have gently curved limbs instead of those sharp elbow bends. I think it's funny how you either get really low handholds like the 1995 version, which is also wrong, or these weird high Romeo and Juliet style handholds that are also really bad. Sigh. The third dance is very similar to the second both in tune and formation and figures, and again, it's an original composition. We don't really get to see much of the dance itself except circling and leading in at one point and one turn. 
You can just repeat my criticism of this last dance for this one as well. But remember this tune, it's gonna come up again. The fourth dance uses a real English country dance tune called Mr. Lane's Maggot from 1695. So again, a real tune, but it's too old. The figures they use are from the same period. So things like up a double and back and arming are glaring anachronisms. The one thing I will say in its favor, however, is that the tune has a strong driving quality to it and seems to underline Mrs. Bennett's anger in this scene, and that works well. The next dance we see takes place at Lucas Lodge, and the tune is a repeat from the Meriton Ball scene. Wow, that's really musically uninteresting to the audience. What passes for figures in this dance seem to be merely circling in a double and those awkward Romeo and Juliet hand turns. So not great. On to the Netherfield Ball. The first dance we see is to a tune called Hyde Park from 1651. That's over 150 years too early. It's also badly synced with the dancing, which is a personal pet peeve of mine, though as someone who edits film myself, I understand why it happens. The original dance was a square set, and although this isn't the original choreography, the square set formation they're using would have been accurate for the Regency where quadrilles and cotillions were popular. The choreography they're using does have the only instance of footwork in this adaptation, namely this hay that they're doing in the background, which actually looks pretty good. The rest of the figures don't look bad either, except for this walking single file circle. Don't know what's up with that one. Let's look at the Mr. Collins dance now, which makes me laugh because it's just so painfully bad. Some of it intentional and some of it not. The thing is, I get having Collins dance badly in this scene. He's supposed to be a bad dancer, but the rest of the dancers look sloppy too so it kind of lessens the effect. If you're curious if the figures are historically accurate, arming was not period, and raising the arms above that head like that doesn't make it look better because it wasn't a thing in the Regency either. Also, I think I said already that patty cake wasn't used for Regency era country dancing, but I'm going to reiterate it. It looks bad. And turn singles weren't used in the Regency either. But the thing I really have to snark about here is Mr. Collins dancing this. What is this? To me, it looks like a drunk guy imitating a Morris dance. Someone should make this into a GIF though. I really need a bad dancing GIF like this to use. And now we come to the Darcy dance. Folks, I think I found the culprit that's responsible for the slow Baroque Darcy dancing that drives me crazy. Here it is. And as much as the scene in the 2005 version was clearly inspired by the 1995 version, and the 1995 version was another BBC production made just 15 years after this one, is this version the origin of that trope I hate? Oh wow, it seems plausible. I think I've gone from disliking the dancing in this version to positively detesting it. Ugh. Oh, and if you're curious about the figures, and whether or not they're period, yeah, the up a double and back and the hole in the wall crossing are not, and there were no honors in the middle of the dance like that either. And like all the other long way sets we see, this one doesn't progress great. Also, this Darcy dance tune is a repeat of one of the songs we heard at the Meriton Ball scene. So that's two dance tunes that get repeated in this series. That's profoundly uninteresting from a musical point of view. I mean, it's true that tunes and figures were made to be freely interchangeable in the Regency, but repeating tunes over and over again was a sign of bad taste and is really boring for a theatrical piece where there's literally thousands of English country dance tunes you could choose from, and they didn't even choose a correct style for the era. So, epic fail. Let's look at the final dance of this series. Oh good, I'm almost done. This has been painful. Anyway, this is a real English folk tune, and one we've already heard in another Jane Austen adaptation, Juice of Barley, which we heard in the ITV version of Emma. It's another tune that's way too old. Also, it's really hard to see the figures in this dance, both because of the way it's shot and the fact that it's being danced really poorly. I noticed a lot of these set formations look sloppy, but this one is by far the worst. 
As someone who teaches and calls English country dances, I can spot when dancers are struggling to get through a dance, and these dancers are barely holding it together. You can see them hesitating before the figures in this shot, and one couple actually goes the wrong way. This is easily the worst, the most unintentionally bad English country dancing I've ever seen on film. And they printed this take when someone unintentionally made a mistake. They cared so little about the dancing that they actually used a bad take. Right, yeah, I'm done with this version. I'm so glad this is the last dance because I literally can't take any more of this. To sum it up quickly, none of the tunes are from the right era. The circle formations are bogus. None of the long way sets even progress. The figures are a mixed bag at best, the execution of the dances is either sloppy and unprofessional or absurdly simple, and it generally feels as if minimal effort was put into these dances. I could conceivably be kinder about all these faults, but the sloppiness was the final straw for me. If you just don't care about the dancing, I don't care to give you a decent grade. The only kind thing I can say about this is that they knew in general and vague terms what English country dancing looked like, and they used a handful of real dance tunes. That's it. Final score is one dance slipper, and that's a generous revision after I had initially decided to only give half a slipper. And here's a new feature suggested by one of my viewers. If you're curious of how all the adaptations I've reviewed thus far stack up against each other, here's a list. At the bottom is this 1980 production of Pride and Prejudice with just one dance slipper. Then the 2020 version of Emma with just two dance slippers. The 1972 Emma with 2.5. The 2009 Emma also with 2.5 the 1996 ITV Emma with three, the 1996 Miramax film with three, the 2005 Focus Features Pride and Prejudice with three, and finally, the 1995 Pride and Prejudice by the BBC with 3.5 dance slippers. So that's my review of the 1980 BBC Pride and Prejudice. Let me know in the comments if you've actually seen this version and what you think of it. If you enjoyed this video, please help us reach a wider audience by liking, subscribing to the channel, leaving a comment, and sharing this video with your friends. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. There's still one more Pride and Prejudice adaptation left to review, namely the 1940 MGM film starring Laurence Olivier and Greer Garson. But because it's not actually set in the Regency, I'm going to save it for a bonus episode after I finish reviewing all the Jane Austen adaptations that are set in the Regency. Moving on from Pride and Prejudice, the subject of my next review will be Northanger Abbey, which has two adaptations, one from 1987 and one from 2007. Thanks for watching and have an ostentatiously good day. I've never lost in battle or game. I'm simply the best by far. When swords are crossed, tis always the same. One blow and au revoir. C'est moi, c'est moi, so admirably fit. A French Prometheus unbound. And here I stand with valor untold, exceptionally brave, amazingly bold, to serve on the table round.